something special to offer. Sure you do, and so does our guest, and she'll share her special something in just a moment. You've got something to offer, something that's new, something to offer, and that something is you. You've got something to offer, something that's new, something to offer, and that something is you. You've got to something to offer the show that spotlights people living their dreams and making a difference and now the host of our show Anne Marie Offer something to offer and that something is you my guest today is the founder and driving force behind the Motown Historical Museum this is a former executive of Motown Records, Mrs. Esther Gordy Edwards, and I want to thank you so much for being here. It's a privilege to me. And we are obviously in Detroit. Well, we're not obviously, but we are in Detroit. Anyway, Ms. Edwards, when you took me through the museum, it was wonderful, and I got such a sense of how close your personal family was, and your parents seemed to play a very integral part in your development, and I wondered what their contribution was to the success of all you Gordy children. Well, there were eight children of us, and they really did make us feel that we were special and that we could do anything that anybody else could do. And we were, uh, we thought we could. <laughs> and, uh, and they just, you know, they, 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 they were family values and uh, uh, philosophies that they in, put into us, you know, uh, treat everybody right. Uh, the more you do for others, the more God would do for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, whatever you do, be what you want to be, mm -hmm. and uh, just be the best at it. And so that was. Those are some of the background reasons that that I think we did do fairly good in so far. I think more than fairly good. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you. Um, did you have a, a favorite song or a favorite artist that was especially dear to you or to your heart w during the whole process of um, raising up these performers? Well, the first oh, five or six years, I was personal manager of the artist, the Motown artist, and ran that uh, department of, oh, we call it a department, but it was a separate um, uh, corporation. Uh, International Talent Management mm -hmm. Corp because we had such a stable of artists mm -hmm. and they were all minors. Uh, I think when Smokey Robinson met Barry Gordy, he was 18. Mm. And of course, you know, Stevie Wonder was about 11 and a half. Right. And the Supremes were 16 and 17. And, uh, um, you know, the Please Mr. Postman girls were mm -hmm. 15 and 16. and. Um, the miracle, I mean, just the, 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 the artists that went on to become so famous throughout the world, the mm -hmm. Four Tops, the Temptations and all. And so I was, ran the, what was personal manager, you know, charting the career, what engagements they take, what they don't take, how mm -hmm. they travel, who travels with them, mm -hmm. uh, chaperones, uh, road managers, and, and that sort of thing. And so I really loved them all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if you favorites, you know, in a family, usually the babies are, are favorites, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, in a manner of speaking, mm -hmm. uh, Stevie Wonder was, was one of the artists that I, I traveled a lot with. And, you know, he was only 12 years old mm -hmm. when he really got well, his big They used to call him Little Stevie Wonder. Little Stevie Wonder. <laughs> And of course, uh, as I said, I really love them all. Smokey Robinson, Marvin Gaye was a, uh, someone else that took a lot of my time. You know, Marvin was different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and there were just, uh, you know, just all of them. Uh, Junior Walker, everybody. It's good you didn't like uh -huh. play favorites then. Oh, no. I, I, I acted like my parents. Mm -hmm. We all thought when they passed away or before we each one thought we were the favorite mm -hmm. but uh, we found out that everyone felt the same way and we didn't know it <laughs> that's know. good then yes. nobody felt slighted in any way that's right well, we're going to take a moment from our, for an offering mm -hmm. and when we come back um, Ms. Edwards will share more about the role she played in helping these young artists develop and we'll talk more about Motown and then we'll get into 
how her dream expanded into the museum. So come back in a moment. You won't want to miss this. We're back with Miss Edwards. And Miss Edwards, I wanted to ask your brother, Barry Gordy, of course, the founder of Motown, he had a dream and a vision which seemed like the whole family got behind. And, and we're going to show some tape in a little while, not yet. Um, but I wanted you to share, if you could, a bit of the journey uh, in the process of the development of Motown, because you were right alongside him all the way. So. Yes. Well, that's true. However, I must say that Barry Gordy did not set out to build a Motown corporation right. uh, as it became. He really had just opted to not work in the job that he had. He quit his good $85 a week job <laughs> at the, on the assembly line of Ford Motor Company because he just could not do that routine that, well, he called it a monotony. Uh, monotonous job, you know, mm -hmm. here comes a frame and it rolls down, and someone does something to it and then he gets in and does something. Assembly line. But um, the one thing he did, so he just upped and quit that good $85 a week job and he, uh, his parents, his wife at the time, and all went, well, what are you going to do? What are you, how are you going to make money? What are you going to do, Barry? Well, I'll just write songs, he said. Write, write songs? You've got to get a real job. <laughs> So uh, he was determined that he wanted to enjoy what he was doing, mm -hmm. that he really had to enjoy what he was doing. And he was creative all the time, even from a, a young kid. He was always uh, writing songs and, and uh, creating things. Uh, and so consequently, um, he just started uh, writing songs. And, and um, of course, he lost his first family for a while there because he was divorced, and uh, and he started hanging around a publishing house, and he wrote songs for Jackie Wilson, Reet Petit, To Be Loved, I'm Wondering, That's mm -hmm. Why Lonely Teardrops, mm -hmm. and uh, then he thought, well, I'll get me an artist, and um, because Jackie was someone else's artist, and mm -hmm. I'll get me an artist, and I will write for them, and I will make records, and I will take them to New York and sell them to major companies. Mm -hmm. And so that was his uh, dream, and the house he bought, which is now Hitsville, USA, mm -hmm. and which now uh, is a part of the Motown Historical Museum, mm -hmm. that original house where he lived upstairs. And he told me once, he said, if I ever get this house paid for, I've got it made. He said, I will write songs, I will make records, and I will take them and sell them, and then I will make a deal with the record company to keep their artists, I will manage the artists, he said, but they, I will keep that artist in hit material. And uh, so that was the way he, he started out. Yeah, very yeah. determined. I like, you know, that he named the house even Hitsville USA is like a definite determination. Absolutely. No, you know, no bombs, they're all going to be hits. <laughs> it's really great. I wanted to ask, did you always want to be part of this industry? And when does like the dream or goal of someone else that you care about become your own? Or how did it become your own or part of your own? Well, I tell you, I finished uh, uh, high school, Cass Tech High School in Detroit. I went on to college. And all through my uh, years of uh, curriculum, uh, my, my, uh, my curriculum was science and chemistry major, and mm -hmm. that's what I took. I never intended, and I don't consider myself being creative, uh, s such as writing songs or shaping shows and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, but I, having grown up the family, having grown up in business, mm -hmm. you know, we grew up in a grocery business from the time that we could walk or talk. We had mm -hmm. to work in the grocery business. We didn't know what we wanted to be when we grew up, but we knew we did not want to be in the grocery business. Mm -hmm. And so Barry Gordy was just a youngster that was genius from a kid. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that, and I thought uh, that he was going to make it someday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and I just wanted to help him originally, and then, of course, uh, when I saw what was happening and, and he was, you know, uh, 
you know, he, he was kind of a kid that was mischievous and it didn't, wasn't too much of a good student in school. And, um, and he was always into something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I, he, he still had that genius uh, ability and that creative ability and he would always figure out how to do something less, uh, you know, with less um, effort, uh, maybe? Effort, yeah. uh, see. Say, Ingenuity. And, uh, yeah, that's right. And so he was the one to watch. And uh, so that's how I got you know, involved with him from the before the beginning. Uh, so, well, he probably needed I, to take you as I, a very steady hand, and he probably needed somebody who, to ground him periodically when he was getting well, all his ideas and stuff right. like that. That's right. So I, I was uh, kind of a the gal Friday in it in the administration part of the business mm -hmm. uh, most of the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had spoken about earlier, and, and I find it, especially when we were talking the other day, you did take this awesome responsibility of the artist management. And I wonder what it's really like to be a personal manager to young talent and these impressionable artists, and what you expected of them, and what did you hope to give them so that they were prepared? Because we talked a lot about how they had to be prepared to go out to Europe or to a road tour and, and right. how much care. Well, I think that the way we were brought up and the um, curriculum that I took, uh, it was more uh, exact science and, and, um, and uh, quality and service and uh, perfection. Mm -hmm. We strived for, for excellence in everything we did, you mm -hmm. know, and we as young people, we could go into business for ourselves because mm -hmm. we lived upstairs over our grocery store and it had storefronts and, mm -hmm. and we could, if we had an idea, we could uh, get some free rent for about six months. Mm -hmm. And so we tried a lot of things as young people growing up in business. Mm -hmm. My parents thought that that was your way to make it to the top mm -hmm. is um, economic development and mm -hmm. economic independence. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, I think all of that played a part. It wasn't so much that we knew how to, um, you know, do uh, make artists. You know, we just knew that if they had a product that was a better product, that it would sell. At least that's what our parents told us. Right. And so, consequently, it was more logic and judgment, and as my dad would always say, mother wit. And uh, so I think in those days with the young people that were, you know, they, we were all um, striving for, you know, uh, to, to do good and they were young people who may have been less fortunate financially like we were. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so they, they really were just glad to have, uh, be in a family and, a, and Barry was kind of a father mm -hmm. figure. and. Um, and so we just did learn and used our best judgment as to what would happen. We knew that Barry said he learned from his job at Ford Motor Company where he, they'd have a raw frame coming down and it would go off that assembly line, a spanking brand new car. And he, he took that along with him in his artist. He felt that uh, these artists would just be completely normal, kids from the neighborhood and with um, if they wanted to ha if they had the talent and they had uh, wanted to be super or wanted to be the best uh, and they had character and he said I could talk with them for five minutes and I'll know whether they got that whether they love their mother and whether they will be manageable and then I'll make them a star and so with that uh, they had to make records but they also had to have music they had to have songs so mm -hmm. therefore the music publishing company uh, uh, Smokey Robinson was a great writer from the I mean he was a good writer kid he came with about a hundred songs when he did it, his audition mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and then Barry Gordy and then of course even Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and all of those that never r had written songs before they learned many mm -hmm. of the artists became writers you see mm -hmm. so it was just based on um, Barry was a very liberal free person that gave uh, uh, 
uh, uh, young people with, with uh, creativity, uh, he just uh, uh, just do it, just do it, try it. It's kind of like you let the garden grow. Anyway. Yes, that's yeah. right. You could walk in off the street and uh, just start doing something at Motown and the next thing you knew you'd have a job, you know. I know, I was going to ask, and you covered a lot of it, when we were going through, I just, you know, the whole idea of being a surrogate family and it sounds like in, back in the days, those doors were always open. Somebody was upstairs probably grabbing Absolutely. something to eat or something to drink, that's right. going to record, practicing, right. working. It was a hustling, bustling That's place. Right. I think it was a, sometimes you have to have an environment to be creative, and it seems like Absolutely. the Gordys provided that. Well, style. that house, Barry Gordy lived upstairs at his office down front, the recording studio. It was open 24 hours a day mm. from 1959 to 1972. And so, of course, uh, those young people, they were there. You could get out of a nightclub and want to run by Hitsville to see what was happening. And you may see the four tops in there recording, mm -hmm. or the Miracles, or or Marvin Gaye, and um, it was just a wonderful place to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and they w or else they'd be rehearsing or writing. Uh, I, I heard one of the um, um, four tops say, uh, Levi. He said, uh, you know, he'd get an idea, and he'd call the other fellows uh, at midnight or so. Said, hey guys, let's let's run over to the Hitsville. We want to. Uh, I got an idea, mm -hmm. and they'd be there, and they'd just be there working and all like that. Um, so that amazing. was the atmosphere around there, right. and it was just wonderful. It's like a laboratory for Absolutely. all the experiments that we're so grateful for. Um, you, you know, as we said, it wasn't necessarily Mr. Gordy's intention to like have this big thing, but it happened, and he built this incredible, quite an empire in Detroit, which contributed to this community and his efforts com contributed to all over the United States and the world. Um, were, you ever, were you ever surprised or was he ever surprised or shocked at the magnitude of the impact of his efforts? Does he ever kind of go, oh my goodness, I'm, or did you well, ever go? I don't, I don't think that um, that ever, you know, we, we never, I, I was surprised when the headquarters moved to California that mm -hmm. so many foreign visitors would show up in Detroit. They'd say, they come to America to come to Detroit to come to, uh, the Motown, uh, Motown, mm -hmm. and uh, they thought the the headquarters was still in Detroit. And when they get there, and of course there was uh, a, an office there, and wh where the re uh, recording studio A was, and the, that was where most of the hits were cut. And uh, they would just show me their arms. They get goose pimple, pimples and uh, chills. They said just standing in the studio where all of these artists had recorded. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the idea that gave me um, uh, the, you know, the, the thought of maybe we made history and didn't know it, mm -hmm. and maybe it should be preserved. Uh, one day it was the whole British Navy seemed to be out there, and uh, about 50 guys all in white, and they were just, oh my God, oh my God, and there's Marvin Guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, that was just... Uh, we just had a British wedding at Motown Museum. Really? A British couple from Leeds, England, uh, Philip Dick and and his uh, wife now, Kim. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to get married at the Motown Museum. They said there was no place else in the world that they wanted to oh, do nice. that. And uh, that the Motown songs were the song tracks of their lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was not a happening in their life that a that, that a Motown song didn't go with. They always had a song to right. fit whatever the uh, the uh, conditions were. Mm -hmm. So um, you know that was uh, that, that in in working with the artists. You know, it was just uh, doing what you what you do and and whatever the situation was uh, to just logic it out and make sure that they were. Uh, taking the right engagements. Mm -hmm. We decided what they would take, what they would not take, how mm -hmm. they traveled, who traveled with them, mm -hmm. uh, where they stayed, and, uh, and just everything 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with human beings, well, 24 hours a day. These mm -hmm. were minors. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what we did. That's what my job was. Right, you guys did a great job. We're going to take a moment for an offering, and then um, Ms. 
Edwards has told us a little bit, but we're going to get more into how she really spearheaded this museum. And we're not going to get it from the grapevine, we're going to get it from the source right here, and we'll see you back in a minute. We're back, and Miss Edwards, it's, I know we talked yesterday and you just mentioned about how many people have come from all over the world, and you are, the, I really feel, you're the heart and the beat behind this museum, I think, probably left to your brother. It might not have happened. I don't want to criticize him or anything, but when did you decide it was your mission? Was it when you saw all those soldiers or that, you know, we needed to have a museum and you sort of slid that in to your brother on the sly, kind of subtly? Well, actually, um, when I called him after the Motown 25 special, because we logged 600 phone calls and the headquarters had moved to Hollywood, California, mm -hmm. and uh, people were just calling from all over the country complimenting that TV special, mm -hmm. and we got several calls from uh, Europe. And I called DeBerry and I said, you know, how many, are you all getting calls? And of course he said, what kind of, what calls? And when I told him what was happening, it was then that I said, you know, maybe we really ought to uh, try to save this uh, history and, and disseminate it and encourage young people and the future generations. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, he said that uh, I'm not going to be in the museum business because I don't know anything about it. Um, I've got all this business out here that I've got to think about, so don't even ask me about a museum. And of course, since I was in Detroit and I was running just the, the, the all of the headquarters and the artists were in California, but there were a lot of things uh, mm -hmm. that at the, we had offices in New York and Toronto and mm -hmm. and England, and so uh, I was lay, our office was a liaison for that and mm -hmm. public relations and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But now um, I just said, well, fine, and went on and and thought, well, how can we? do this. I'm a pack rat anyway. I save, save, save ever since I was traveling a lot with mm -hmm. the artist. And then at one time for a f number of years, I ran our international operations, mm -hmm. setting up licensees and sub-publishers. And so I've been around quite a, quite a part of the world just uh, working with that, along with everything that went on in America. It went on around mm -hmm. the world, even the artist engagements and things. And so that that international part of Motown was my, I was heading up that department mm -hmm. too. And so consequently, um, um, I just had saved a lot of mm -hmm. things. And of course, the normal artifacts, the recording Studio A is just as it was right. in the 60s. You come there, you look in the control room, you see where the the uh, producers of records and things, they, they wore the floor out by, mm -hmm. you know, keeping time with the music and, and you see the baby grand piano, the, um, you know, all of the other instruments, the drums and right. the, the uh, uh, you know, isolation booths mm -hmm. and things, that was there. 50, in 60s, in the 60s and all, because so they did you, not take that. You had so your base. all of that is, we had the fundamentals for mm -hmm. preserving it, but then of course it just became, how do we do this? So I thought, mm -hmm. well, let me see, maybe I'll just do a public museum, be nonprofit, and then I can ask for right. people to support us and that sort of thing. So right. that's exactly how it happened. Okay, so I have so many more questions, but I want to make sure we show the video and you can explain a little bit about we were able to shoot a little bit of the museum and it should come up momentarily. And I wanted to ask, was, were this, while they're bringing up the video, were the steps difficult to become a museum? Did you face any roadblocks or was it pretty smooth sailing to get it established as a museum? Not really. Because oh, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's that Hitsville, USA. Yeah. It's historical house. You know, the state of Michigan declared it a historic site. Right, you that's a that landmark. There. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh -huh. and, this and is that's hard, the way yeah. we grew down the street. When mm -hmm. Barry Gordy needed more space, he said, buy another house, buy another house. We had eight houses mm -hmm. on the uh, seven on one side, and then we bought the one right across the street. And this is the, the artist. This is a part of the personal management. Mm -hmm. This is the first tour, Motortown Review tour, that went on the road. Mm -hmm. It was called Motortown Special. 
but that is the troop that went out. You see there the the uh, the uh, contours. Do you love me? Was a big song, and mm -hmm. the Supremes and Martha and the Vandellas and the Marvelettes and and um, 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 Mary Wells was on that tour. And this and is fascinating. This is you guys had that cooperative family financial yes, cooperative. Yes. Well, we that's where Barry Gordy borrowed the eight hundred dollars to to make his first record of his own uh, from the family savings club there. He wrote a little note to influence the vote because he had to pay an interest because he was borrowing more than he had saved and um, and he had to get a hundred percent vote uh, before he could get that eight hundred dollars. He used that money to make that record called Come to Me by Marv Johnson. He mm -hmm. sold that record to United Artists recording company and Marv Johnson became a United Artists recording star and there uh, you are well there I am <laughs> doing your job yep uh-huh and uh, and so uh, yeah it was it was wonderful times there at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon outside the Pittsville USA house and the others were just filled with kids from the suburbs sports cars and these are the marquees uh, some of the famous places uh, that uh, the, the artists Apollo. played if there's the Apollo Theater and the Fox, Fox Theater mm -hmm. in Detroit every 10 days Christmas to New Year's there was a Motortown review mm -hmm. it, at the Fox Theater and we did that because we wanted our artists to be home for Christmas right that's nice uh -huh. now that's like just a montage. a montage of many of the artists including Gladys Knight and the Pips and the right. Com and the Commodores, Lionel Richie and mm -hmm. and the Jackson Five. Those were artists that you know came on in the exactly. late sixties. Um, we have about one minute. I can't believe how fast this goes. And I wondered, Miss Edwards, what would you um, advise a person who's going after any goal or dream? Would you have a some words of wisdom to share with them about? pursuing something that they want, be it in the music industry or anything. Yes, well, what happens, I'll just quote Barry Gordy, uh, so many artists want to be like someone else, I want to be like him, and he would say, no, be like yourself, just be like yourself, you're unique, you're different, be yourself, and uh, and that was the way it was in our family, there were eight of us, and uh, we could become anything that we were interested in, you see. And so we started out, my sister Gwen uh, Gordy Fuqua, who now uh, owns uh, her, I mean, she has a, a, a publishing company herself, Sweet Love, that uh, mm -hmm. Anita Baker does is hers and, and others. And then she was the first entrepreneur in the family and she had a two table pool room when she was 18. Wow. And so we could be anything that we thought it's something that you like to do whatever you want to do then you pursue that and then do the very best you can okay and, and so I'm that is it I gotta go so until next time do the very best you can and thank you for joining yes. us thank you so much oh, it, was it was wonderful it was to be fun. here wardrobe and echo videotape on 9th Avenue for helping to make this show possible. But we would especially like to thank you for watching. I'm Jeannie Devlin. We look forward to having you with us next week. And in the meantime, remember, the world needs what you have to offer. To all you internet users, please visit us on www.freeinfo.com.